Well, you know, I've, I've always wanted to be a bird and fly. And in particular, the, the birds of prey, the, the birds that soar, the birds that use the wind and seem to be up there, just gently moving a wing and staying up and looking down. So if I was one of those birds of prey, or seagulls too, just gliding, looking for food, and then whoosh, swooping down. And I've watched the hornbills in Gombe, and the Jackson's hornbill has a lovely swooping flight like this. And it would be complete magic to fly above the world and look down, and wonderful. I'm tremendously grateful for having been born with the most amazing and supportive mother. I was born loving animals, all animals, and spent my time as a tiny child watching earthworms and things like that. And my mother supported it. She didn't even get mad when she found my bed full of earth and worms when I was 18 months. And then, you know, the amazing story when I was four and a half, she took me for a holiday on a farm, a proper farm, not one of these terrible intensive factory farms that we have today. Uh, we lived in London, so it was really exciting. Cows, pigs, horses, sheep, and I was given a job to protect, to collect the hen's eggs, and they mostly laid them in these little uh, hen houses where they also slept at night, and I would go around and if there was an egg, I'd pop it in my basket. And apparently I began asking everybody, but here's the egg. Where is the hole on the hen big enough for that egg to come out? And nobody told me. So I remember distinctly seeing a hen going into a hen house, and I must have thought, ah, she's going to lay an egg. Now I'll find out for myself. Crawled after her, big mistake. She flew out with squawks of fear. So I must have thought, this is now a dangerous place. No hen will lay an egg here, but I'm on the path to discovery. So I hide in an empty hen house. Apparently I was gone for four hours. and My mother didn't know where I was. She'd even called the police when she saw this excited little girl rushing towards the house. And instead of getting mad at me, she sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg. When that hen came in, and laid her egg. I don't know who was more excited, the hen or me. And <clears throat> so I tell that story because isn't that the making of a little scientist? You've got curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, not giving up, and learning patience. It was all there, and a different kind of mother might have crushed that early scientific curiosity, and I might not have done what I've done. Well, I think I would say um, that if you take a tapestry where there's a beautiful picture and it's all made up of these carefully interwoven little threads of different colors, and so if you're trying to describe biodiversity, you'd show the child this picture, and it could be a picture of all the animals, and then start pulling out the threads. And it's so important for children to understand, as I learned in the rainforest, that each species, even a small one, has a role to play. And the extinction of just one small species may have a big effect on another species, and there may be a ripple effect. And so losing that one little species can lead to the destruction of the whole tapestry. Out of all the dogs I've known, he was, he was different. He was the most intelligent, the most independent, the most loyal. And in fact, if he hadn't died, I could not have gone to Africa. I couldn't have betrayed him by leaving him. I could, just couldn't have done it. What I learned uh, became very, very useful when Dr. Leakey, my mentor, made me go to get a PhD at Cambridge University, even though I hadn't got a prior uh, degree. And I was very nervous. So you can probably imagine 
what it was like when many of the professors told me I'd done all my study wrong, two years, uh, that I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. It was scientific to give them numbers, and I couldn't talk about them having personality, mind, or feeling. That was unique to us. But Rusty had taught me that that was a whole lot of rubbish, and that the professors in this respect were completely, absolutely, and totally wrong. Well, when I first got to Gombe in 1960, the chimpanzees had never seen a white ape before, and they would just run away. And weeks turned to months, and I was getting more and more nervous because I knew our six months' money would run out, and if I hadn't seen something exciting, that would be the end. And then David Greybeard, I called him Greybeard because of the Greybeard, and the David part, I don't really know, but anyway. And he began to lose his fear. And it was he that I saw as I was walking through the forest, a bit depressed. It was cold, it was wet. And I saw him crouched over a termite mound, and I saw him reach out, break off stems of grass, and use them to push down into the termite mound, pull them out, and eat off the termites with his lips. And he also stripped leafy twigs of their leaves to make a tool to fish for termites. And at that time, it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools, by science, that is. And we were defined as man the toolmaker, so when I told Louis Leakey what I'd seen, he, he wrote back and said, well, we shall have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. And so it was that observation, thanks to dear David Greybeard, that Leakey was able to go to the Geographic Society, and they agreed to continue the funding for the research, and they sent out a photographer and filmmaker Hugo van Lauwek, and it was his photographs and film that took the story of Jane and the Chimps, and especially David Greybeard, out into the world. So because of David, he came to accept me, and so if he was in a group that was ready to run, and David was there sitting calmly, I think they looked from him to me and back, and I suppose they thought, well, she she clearly isn't as dangerous as we thought. So gradually, it was almost as though he introduced me to his friends in the forest. When I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park, where we're still doing research now, nearly 60 years later, it had been part of the equatorial forest belt, stretching from East Africa right across to the West African coast. And when I flew over in 1990, I was shocked to see it was a 35 square kilometer patch of forest, like a little island, surrounded by completely bare fields, more people living there than the land could support. Land over, over farmed and infertile. Steep slopes, trees cut down in order to try desperately to grow more food and terrible erosion little streams getting silted up. And that's when it hit me. If we don't help these people to improve their lives, to find ways of living that don't involve destroying the environment to grow food or to make charcoal or make some money, we can't even try to save the chimpanzees. I imagine if I'm trying to describe a chimpanzee to a blind person, that person will have an idea what a human looks like from feeling the body. And I will explain that chimpanzees are very much like us. They just have broader, broader brows above their eyes, their ears stick out more. They've got hairy chins um, and they've got hair all over their body. But they're so like us otherwise, except that we walk upright and they walk on all fours. I'm absolutely convinced, and science is now accepted, that animals do indeed have emotions like ours, happiness, sadness, fear, despair, grief, uh, anger. It's almost the same with chimpanzees, but other animals too. And we go down the line uh, in complexity, 
and we find that amphibians can feel pain and react to it much as we do. And yet, they, in science, they've been treated as mere things. And I remember in, in biology at school, all these dead dogfishes and dead frogs and even dead rabbits that are being killed just for us to cut open. And it, it was so shocking, I gave it up. I, I wouldn't do it. When I see animals being tortured, killed, it makes me feel ashamed of my species. And unfortunately, we do the same to each other. The stories of the Holocaust, for example, are terrible. So it's not only that non-human animals, it's all of us, because we're animals too. And I remember seeing secretly filmed footage of chimpanzees in medical research laboratories. And they were there because their bodies are so like ours, their biology is so like ours, that they can be infected with human diseases that other animals less like us cannot be infected with. And so to see our closest living relative in a five foot by five foot cage, there because scientists thought, ah, we can use this this being as a, as a guinea pig, and we can learn more about how to cure and uh, vaccinate humans. But they weren't prepared to think about the equally striking psychological and behavioral similarities. And when I got into this lab to see with my own eyes and saw Jojo, who'd been in this tiny cage alone for about 20 years, and I knelt down beside the cage and I looked into his eyes, and I thought about the chimpanzees with their life in the forest, up in their leafy nests, spending hours quietly grooming each other, sleeping on the forest floor, playing with the youngsters. And tears began to slide down into my mask, and Jojo reached out a gentle finger and moved the tears. And that was the moment when I vowed that, although I didn't know what to do, I would work and work to end this horrible suffering. We, we just have to work harder to protect these wonderful animals with whom we share this planet. And so we need to, yes, make more legislation. Yes, we need to support with better equipment the rangers fighting on the ground. Yes, we have to work to reduce the demand, and all that requires educating people, helping them to understand, telling stories that reach the heart. The main thing we have to do is to help people understand, help people understand that these are beings out there with feelings like ours. Help people understand that we need the environment, we need forests which provide clean water and clean air. And if we continue destroying the environment, that's not just the end of the animal species, it's the end of us. If we continue to let climate change go unabated and, and, and we continue with business as usual, then in 50 years, they say, uh, the planet will be unlivable in for us unless we find peculiar ways of, of living, but I don't think we can. So we have to get into people's hearts. You can't argue with the head. People come up with arguments to prove that they're right and you're wrong. But if you tell stories, and story gets to the heart, even if it doesn't appear while you're talking to them that you've made a point, later on you sometimes find you change that person's life. I certainly agree. It was Mahatma Gandhi who first said, the planet can provide enough for human need, but not human greed. And as far as I'm concerned, there are three main problems we have to overcome, and they all seem impossible to overcome. One is extreme poverty, because if you're really poor, you're going to destroy the environment to try to live, you have to. If you're in an urban area, you're going to buy the cheapest food. You can't afford to say, 
How was it made? Uh, did it harm the environment? Did it result in cruelty to animals? Uh, is it cheap because of child slave labor or sweatshops? You just have to buy it to survive. The second problem we have to overcome, which in a way is even harder, is the unsustainable lifestyle of everybody else. Almost everybody I know has more than they need. And many people even have a whole lot more than they actually want. And the way that we waste, we waste food. We throw away tons of food and there are people dying of starvation, like the pictures of the little children in Yemen because of the war. And so we have to somehow change attitudes, change the way we think to learn to live with less and to ask ourselves when we buy something, do I really need it? And then finally, there's human population growth. So as countries rise up out of poverty, everybody wants to have the same lifestyle as, as we have, and you can't blame them. But if the human population goes on growing, and the expectations out of life continue growing, we're on a planet with finite natural resources. And it, it doesn't make any sense that we can have unlimited economic development of the kind that we are blessed with on a planet with finite natural resources. And in some places, indeed, we've greedily taken those natural resources faster than Mother Nature can replenish them. Do you think, do you understand that each and every one of us makes some impact on the planet every day and that we have a choice as to what kind of impact we want to make? And people tend to, to feel helpless and hopeless the more they know about the problems in the world. And so to everybody out there, I hope that you realize that you make a difference each day and you have a choice as to what kind of difference you're going to make. I think probably all of us are afraid of the process of dying and hope that when we die it'll be a quick ending. I'm not afraid of death. And, you know, when you die, it's either the end of everything, in which case it's the end of everything, and you wouldn't know anymore, or there is something beyond death. And if that is so, what an amazing and exciting adventure, probably the most exciting adventure of my life, or, or next life, or whatever. <laughs>